The biggest thing that people don't know about college is that I learned after I sent my kids to school is that college is a buyer's market. So unlike many things that you see, here's a sticker price and you pay it. There are sticker prices in college, but they don't matter. Hello and welcome to the Retire Once Show. The show is designed to help you get to retirement, but most importantly, stay retired. I'm your host, Jonathan Rankin. I'm the founder and CEO of Theorem Wealth Management, and I'm joined, as always, by my lovely co-host. Hi, I'm Melissa Rankin. Thank you for joining us. And just for those who have been joining us here on this journey of retirement paradise for the past couple of weeks, uh, please know I did spell my wife's name wrong for the past, I don't know, every episode that we've done so far. Uh, it only has two S's. and It's that, not Melissa. No, I put three S's in there. So that was fun to go home and realize and get to share with her. But uh, fun night at the Rankin household. So, But we're moving on. We are moving on and we are happy that you are here. I had the opportunity this week to sit down with my good friend, Matt Moline who is the author of the book. Most of want to share the book. It's The Empty Nest Full of Pockets, How to Emotionally and Financially Prepare for Your and Your Child's Future. And honestly, it's it's a fantastic book. We have small kids. I mean, we've talked about them before, but this book just helps kind of, I feel like, prepare you for when you become an empty nester. It, it truly just is enlightening. I, I mean, I don't know how else to explain it. I was... I was at a place where I, I couldn't put it down. I was starting to try to emotionally prepare myself already. I mean, it's a fantastic read. Yeah, and what I love about the book, and we're going to get into it a little bit with Matt here, uh, is the fact that it's it's not just a finance book. It's not about how to plan for college, the financial mechanics behind that. It's really the, the kind of the both worlds of the emotional part and the financial part. And I think a lot of people ignore that emotional side of it. And I started reading it and I did, I felt the same way you did where I started thinking, God, Harvey's five and in 13 years, he's going to be gone. And five years went by fast. And so at some point he's going to be gone. And so now I'm already emotionally preparing for it. And some of the advice that he gives in there on social media and, you know, how to interact with your kids as they become older and become more friends. It's a fantastic read. And I'm excited to be able to share this journey with you that uh, Matt went on while writing it. A lot of the personal stories that he shares in the book are just, they're great to read. And, you know, you get to hear from it's his so relatable. I mean, you can't not, if you have kids, especially you, you can't read this book and not be like, oh, I've been there or, oh, that's familiar. I mean, it's, it's so relatable. It's amazing. It is. And so without further ado, this is my interview with Matt Moline. Okay. So we are joined today by my good friend, Matt Moline, the author of this amazing book right here, Empty Nest, Full Pockets. Matt, I, I, there's so much to dig into on this book. I'm so glad that we got to get the chance to sit down and go through this. Um, but before we jump into the actual contents of the book, I want you to share your story, just you, your personal background, your family, because you share a lot of that in the book. And I feel like it's important for viewers to know a little bit about who you are and who, who the family members are that you talk about in this book. You bet. I'd be glad to. First, thanks for having me on your show here and admire your work. And we are, have been good uh, colleagues as we've launched our own firms about the same time and gotten to know each other. I'm sure appreciated getting to know you and your creativity and the work you and your wife are putting out there. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. So we are a blended family of six, excuse me, four kids. And so, um, my two are 24 and 25 year old. Matthew's living in Denver Anne is living in Chicago and they're both very successful in their careers and off and running. And then my stepkids are twins, a boy and a girl, both in graduate school. One's about to leave and start his career at RSM, which is a local accounting firm, national accounting firm. Um, he's going to be a CPA starting in October. And then Natalie's finishing up her graduate degree in marriage and family counseling. Wow. Where we've agreed she cannot shrink my wife and I ever. So. <laughs> so one thing about the book that you talk about is that you guys were able to put all four of these kids through college. Now, what, first of all, what made you want to share that story? You know, the, your journey of what you've done with, you know, congratulations, by the way, because as we know, that's not any easy feat these days with the cost of college, but 
what made you want to share your story and, and write this book? So the journey of them growing up so close together happened very, very quickly. And even parents that have, you know, one or two children that are maybe two years, three years apart, it just goes through in a snap. These four, they were in a very tight cluster in ages. And so we knew we were going to have some big challenges with the teenage years, of course, and then how we're going to pay for college for four kids. You throw in ex-spouses and the way financial aid works with all that. And it was incredibly confusing. And I'm a financial advisor. And so I thought, wow, if it's confusing for me, I've got to have some company out there that can use some help. And so we thought, and the other thing is, is that the emotional, the, uh, excuse me, the empty nest journey was really emotional for me as they grew up and developed independence, emotions I wasn't ready for. So I thought sharing some of that combined with some financial input on putting you back, you being the, the uh, parent in charge of the college planning process and how you're going to pay for that might be helpful. Yeah. What I love that you've done. I mean, you even break down, how do you, how do you manage social media with your kids? I mean, I've got a four and a five-year-old, obviously they're nowhere near social media, but at some point that's going to happen. I love that you shared those type of aspects about that in this book. Um, because this, when I read it, I realized, you know, when we were talking about you writing this book, I thought, okay, it's going to be another financial book about the mechanics of financial planning for college. And I thought, okay, that's great. And then when I picked it up, I, I honestly couldn't put it down because it's so much more than that, that you really do tie in that emotional journey that you and Lisa went through, you know, as your kids started to grow older. And that's the part that, you know, I, I really do love in, in what you share in the book. But you, you talked in the book about financial education for your kids. At what age and, and really how did you start that process? We found the greatest way to start that was by actually getting some money in their pocket. So allowance and chores and getting to understand if I do X, I get Y. And then I'm a big believer in part-time jobs. We have some great part-time opportunities in the central Iowa area that we had the kids pursue. And so once they begin to get a little bit of money and then they also want to do things, you, you teach them how that goes together. So dad's going to help with these things. But if you want to do some, an extra trip with your friends or you want something, you want to add my son was a car freak. So he wanted to always add like a steering wheel cover or a gear shift cover or these interior lights. And it's on you, brother. So if you want to, you want to do that stuff, that's going to be, but they, I talk about it in the book a lot because you can't really teach them any of this if they don't have any money, Yeah. if they don't have any coming in or understand how it works. So giving them that real life example of you do this, you get this, and then you're able to this. And then of course, we're both advisors and big believers in delayed gratification. So teaching them, if you save for this, then maybe uh, it can be something even bigger down the road for you. And, you know, selfishly, I, you know, obviously I want to share your, you know, your knowledge and your story with everybody listening and watching this, but selfishly, because I have young kids, I look at this as I'm learning from you as well, how you've gone through this because, you know, we want to be able to provide that for our kids as well. And I think that financial mm-hmm. education part is, is just not talked about enough. And so I love the fact you brought that up, but what would you do differently if you were to go back and, you know, you said, okay, Jonathan, you've got a four to five year old. Is it the same? Would you just do it all over again the exact same way? Or, you know, is there anything that you would, might've done a little bit differently? You know, this was actually suggested by another podcast host, podcast host, because he did this with his kid, which was, as they got old enough to understand just the basics of money and how it goes. They join him when he, when he meets with his financial advisor. So they're able to ask questions about Coinbase, crypto. What if I do, you know, the things that they're interested in. So they're catching up on that education piece, but don't be afraid to bring the kids into the journey. So many of us grew up with where money was a faux pas in our homes. Mm. So, you know, in my family, I had no idea 
what my dad was making, if we were having money problems and turns out we were, and I didn't know. Um, and that stuff shows up in, in weird ways, but it's, I feel like it's, you don't have to give them specifics, but to say, well, mom and dad can't afford this and this is why. And so, but maybe we can do this instead. So share, have them share in the challenges. And then there are just so many tools available now that weren't even around when my kids were, were growing up, like Greenlight and some of these apps and things that can really teach them the basics early on. You know, you bring up an interesting point about letting your kids into you know, your financial life as the parent. How do you how do you balance that? You know, how do you just give them enough to say, hey, we, we don't have you know, we can't afford this certain thing or that, but not not make them, you don't want to put that stress or that burden on them. How do you, how do you navigate that balance? Yeah, I think it's, it is finding a balance between scarcity and abundance in your own mental journey as a, as a parent. So understanding you can't do everything, but you can do a lot. And so finding um, that sense of gratitude and how you explain things to your kid, they're going to see that you're not holding on so tight that money should be feared but it also needs to be understood. The second way I'd answer that is to bring them in when they want to go, when the college journey begins. So they, you've got an amazing student getting four plus percent GPAs. All their friends are going to USC, Harvard, Princeton. All they're looking at is US News World Report top 25. Go through the process to show them what you, what first you can afford for college, we call it college pre-approval. And second, even though what you can afford doesn't mean that's what you necessarily want to pay. And so uh, giving them boundaries that, so in, in our family, it was dad will pay for a state university, public university and state. If you want to go to a private school or anywhere else, you'll have to cover the difference. If you can get a better deal, I'll cover that. You'll get that money back. Wow. So that, you know, they're in a journey, they have a very strict framework of how this is going to work. And then another part of the education is helping them understand how like student loans would work and how that's going to affect your income when you're, ret- when you're done with school. And- yeah, that's, you know, I feel like that, that's kind of the, you know, fi- that financial planning aspect of, of college. But I, I really like the fact that you start that early. And, you know, one of the aspects that you talk quite a bit about is that drifting apart and, and really you know, the emotional side of it, as they get older, what age did you find that they just started, you know, where, where dad was, you mentioned in the book, dad wasn't cool anymore. By the way, I love that you referenced Jack and Diane, you know, and, and that John Cougar Mellow Camp song, because we referenced that in our show in a previous episode. So when you, when I saw that in the book, I just had to laugh, but uh, you know, at, at what age did you notice that? And, you know, so I, I'm very curious about that. Yeah, just like they are with money, every kid is different in how they handle independence. So each of the four began their journeys in different ways. <clears throat> I would definitely say in the middle school years, they're beginning to develop different ideas than yours. In the high school years, especially when they begin to drive, they just don't want to spend as much time with you anymore. And so that it's a slow grind of you can feel it. You can feel your relationship beginning to go like this. And it's, if you're not ready for it, you can really fight it. You can be incredibly resentful of the fact that I raised this little S H I T and now they don't even care about what I do or, you know, all I've given you. (laughs) So um, that those type of emotions can build up, but I tell you what, I I share this advice a lot because it helped me so much. I had a friend who was a counselor and we were going through, I said, I'm just, you know, Matthew's driving now. He's never home and is off all about doing her activities and never wants to be home. Um, They're, you know, I just feel like I'm losing them. I feel like they, they don't want anything to do with me anymore. And it really hurts. And he said to me, the only reason that they can do that is because you've raised them to be confident enough to do it. Oh. So after crying for about a half hour, I came back and said, wow, that really helped. <laughs> but, you know, it just, and I, and I share that with parents because it can be so easy to feel like, you know, I, I must've done something wrong. They don't want to be around me. Well, it's because you've done things right that they're able to, to begin to throw their elbows a little bit and, and become who they really are. <laughs> 
I love that perspective, and I think I might actually keep that on like an audio loop so I can replay as I go <laughs> through this journey of raising you know my kids as well. Because you know, even at the age of five, when you you want to do stuff with them, and they just go, "No, I want to do it on my own," you just kind of go, "Well, I." I used to help you put on your shoes. Why can't I do that anymore? Yeah. So yeah, I, uh, the bedtime stories, all that stuff, it just begins to diminish. I love that. I love that piece of advice. Now I, I want to switch gears to the financial side of things. You know, we know uh, being advisors in the business, we know that the cost of education has gone up dramatically and it continues to keep going up. One, how did you and Lisa handle and plan for that? And then two, I know you do a lot of work with families that are planning for, college education, maybe, you know, five, 10, 15, even, you know, 18 years down the line. How are you, how do you help them prepare for that rising cost of education? No, it's a great question and a big problem because of, you talk about inflation in the overall economy, it's been going on in education for years at a high clip. And so for many families, if you're spending, if you're sending, let's say three kids to school, you could easily be looking at a $300,000 expense or more. And so you really have to go into it with the framework of what can we actually afford? How, how can we afford it? Break apart where that money is going to come from those cash flows, understanding how to use your income as an asset and um, setting clear parameters around this is what we're going to do. And I would say having a deep understanding of how debt is going to impact you and or your student or both. And, and being careful in that way. But the biggest thing that people don't know about college is that I learned after I sent my kids to school is that college is a buyer's market. So unlike many things that you see, here's a sticker price and you pay it. There are sticker prices in college, but they don't matter. Everybody, every kid that your kid lives with in the form will be paying a different price for that same education, even if they're the same major. And so understanding how the financial aid system works and making the most of I would, they hate the word negotiate in the admissions office, but understanding how financial aid offers can be used to get the best deal at the school they would really like to go to. Um, it's just, it really is a black box. There's a huge lack of transparency that I loathe and think needs to be exposed to parents and it should know going in because these are things I learned after with the kids that already chosen their schools and I was already paying for it. Yeah, that's, I didn't realize there was any negotiation that can be had. So that's, that is, uh, I'm glad to know that now. So what resources? So you live in Texas, right? Yeah. So there are probably 10 great liberal arts colleges in Texas that will match UT's price if you ask them to. And if you say, this is my kid, this is what they can bring to the school and they'll end up matching it. Or they're going to a different liberal arts school and you say, well, we have, this one's offering X. So just those as, as examples that um, can save parents tons of money. And I think that is one thing that I don't think any parent has. I, I've, never, I've never heard of that before. That is the first time I've ever heard that you can actually go in and say, hey, look, we got this offer over here. They want to come here. here that is... It's fantastic. Um, I, I appreciate you sharing. So, what yep. resources do you do you use? Do you have that uh, that people can start that planning process? I would imagine that you do a lot with you know college planning. What type of resources do you have that people can access? We've got uh, planning tools that can help incorporate the college journey with the retirement second half of life journey, because this is about helping the whole family win. So we want the kid to go to school and have a great, ex uh, you know, experience, but the parents have to be ready for their journey too. And that's really what the book explores is that dual path. Mm -hmm. And so we want families to win and winning in my mind is that you're able to live the second half of life, the best life possible that you can with the resources that you have at the same time, you know, you've done right by your kid. And you don't feel for any reason, any guilt about the way that process went for them. So um, we have software that helps build that type of plan. But then in particular, the tool that I use a lot is what's called college pre-approval. Okay. And it works like a mortgage pre-approval. We take everything that you've saved and or are saving 
Where are the kids thinking about going to school? How much it costs? Scholarships that are available? How you're going to pay for it? And give you a number to say, if you do it at this level, we can make this other plan happen. Wow. If you go above it, we're going to have to borrow, do whatever. If you go below it, it helps everybody in this way. So that pre-approval framework is not something that people think about a lot for college, but shoot, you're paying as much for college in many cases as you are a house. So. Absolutely. And so, you know, I'll make sure that we link to, uh, to that so they can touch base you know, to see how to go through that pre-approval process for college, because you're right. I don't think anybody does that for college, but we do it for cars, you know, homes and, and many other expenses. So that's a, that's a very yep. good, uh, good exercise to go through. When you mentioned student debt and figuring out how much you know someone can actually take on, you know, how can parents and children how can they prepare themselves for that burden? I mean, you you think, I mean, I started college when I was seventeen years old. You know, at seventeen, do you really, you know, you hear the the argument? Do you really know what you're getting yourself into taking on hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt? Possibly, how do you how do you mm-hmm. prepare that? you know, that mental journey. So um, in the pre-approval work, we can show them based on what they're going to major on, what their average income will be based on their, their chosen geography. So if they're going to be in Chicago working as a teacher, they may make the higher end, you know, sixty seventy thousand dollars $70,000. Well, if you've taken on a graduate degree and you've done undergrad where you borrowed the federal max of 27000 and all of a sudden you have loan payments of $1,000 and you're making 3000 a month. How's that going to feel yeah. when you add in Chicago rent? <laughs> yeah, <that's- laughs> so um, we, we can show them based on their chosen profession what they can expect for earnings. And then you begin that whole process of this is what a budget looks like. And if half of it's going to student loan debt, it's, it's not going to work. You, you're going to have two jobs. You're going to have years you can't buy a house get married, have kids. It changes all of your life. Interesting. So pre-planning is the biggest defense against too much debt. One thing that you talked about was how the book sets people up to understand the journey of both the student and the parents. Now, uh, one thing that I always run into is the that parents always have a challenge of deciding, how do I prioritize college or retirement? You know, how, when you're in, what do you usually recommend to parents when they're trying to figure out, okay, which one do I want to put money towards? I've got a finite amount of savings. I can put to my future. I can help my kid out. How do you balance those two? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. It depends quite a bit on what the parents have planned. So if they come in with aggressive goals of being done at 59, working full time and going to, to travel, like your, your beautiful guest did on your show, you can't do that without doing some pretty aggressive savings on your own. So if the other, on the other hand, they have their own business, they want to work until they're 80. Um, they want their kid to have a special education because that's what they were given. I mean, it really comes down to these money mindsets we talk about in chapter three. So it's, if you've got a mindset of, I want the kids to have everything they possibly can, you might have to sacrifice your retirement date or the, you know, how you handle that. If you're a believer of the kids do this all on their own because I don't want them to take care of me later, obviously then. So our job is to determine those mindsets and help unearth that. So Prairie Fire is the name of our firm and it, in Iowa, it's a, a Prairie Fire, is, well, I guess I'll, same thing everywhere, but it's basically you burn the, uh, an area of the prairie to make room for new growth. So it burns the old stuff. So many mindsets that many of us live from are old mindsets that we were raised with, even if you're 55 like I am. So I had a very entrepreneurial father, incredibly conservative nurse mother. So I had two conflicting mindsets when it came to finance, career, taking chances, all that. Well, I always have to ask myself, which message am I living from here? Which one am I making this decision from? So when we work with parents, we try to understand that philosophy a little bit of how that works for them, because if they both grow up incredibly frugally, they're going to approach this whole process way different. Yeah, that is, uh, you know, I I love the way that you put that because you really make it a, you know, something that there is a conscious decision they have to make, but they've got to 
that you do have to sacrifice. It is a sacrifice to put off that retirement. And I think everybody, especially now, they, they want both. They want it all. They don't want their kids to have this massive amount of debt, but they also they don't want to work until they're you know 75 years old. So I, I love the way that you put that. But one thing that I found important in the book that you talked about was the importance of leaving college with a plan and how how do kids know or how do you how do you walk them through how did you walk your kids through uh leaving college with an actual plan of saying okay i spent all this money we spent all this money or who someone did you know what are you going to do with that can you talk a little bit about leaving college with a plan uh, obviously i know it's in the book and i want to spoil everything for for the listeners but i do I, think <laughs> I felt that that was a very important part of it yeah i mean it's return on investment if you're especially if you as a parent are paying You want to know what's going to happen when they're done. So understanding those salary ranges and how that's going to work, really encouraging your child to engage with their career centers at their schools. Um, That was how I got my first job. I spent every Thursday, Friday, filling out applications in the career center, getting interviews. And so um, letting them know the expectation is that they begin doing that before they graduate. Uh, Getting those internships from their sophomores and juniors, beginning to understand what they like to do for work. Um, this is really a, where a parent can be a mentor. So early in life, like right now, Jonathan, you have to tell your kids what to do and that's your job. When it gets to this stage of life, you know, you need to be a partner in the process and you have experiences and you know, things that they don't. And so they don't believe that in many cases. So finding that way to communicate that this is, yes, you can go move to Denver, and you can have this job and, and do what you want. This is how much money you're going to make. So if you go rent a downtown apartment, don't call me when you can't make rent. You know, so this is part of that. We're, we're moving from a partnership to your, your independent life. Okay. So understanding what those return on investments look like based on their major. Allowing them a couple years to kind of find their way through the educational system as to what they like to do. All these kids change their majors. Don't freak out. It's just part of the, the process. But th- to know that they're coming out with a marketable skill and, and skills that they learned in college that they can actually monetize. Otherwise, it's just a hobby. Now, you mentioned changing your major. Trust me, I, I know that. I, I was going to go to school to be a dentist because I was told by my mom that I was good at science. That's not the case. So I spent two and a half years studying <laughs> chemistry and biology. And I still thank my mom the, to this day for setting me off on the wrong path when I started studying biology and chemistry. Hey, but, man, uh, that, was, that was me and computers. I started in computer programming, and I loathed it. <laughs> yeah, so, luckily, we both found our passion. Come. That's right. <laughs> uh, I want to switch to the parent side of it because, obviously, title of the book, Empty Nest, you know, we're, we're talking about that journey from the parent's perspective as well. And so – You've been through it. You know what it's like. And I know you work with a lot of people that have gone through it as well. What is the biggest challenge of going through that process of knowing, okay, I'm going to be an empty nester at some point. What talk a little bit about that journey and the, and the challenges that people go through. It's the, the biggest challenge is that people come into it and they're not ready. So they've been spending all this time as a parent. It's good work. It's important work, but they are going to be gone. There will be a Friday that you're sitting at home and the kids are gone. And so, um, you know, communicating with your partner and understanding some of the things that you want to do now that your life is going to look different to fill some of those holes is things that you have to do before it happens if you can. So you hear about empty nest syndrome, people having going into depression. This is what happens when you're not realizing, all right, my life is about to be drastically different. Yeah. And so we really try to focus on that in the book because we did some preparation and it really helped. And so as they began to leave and stuff, and it was, I talk about the first Friday, you know, you're not pounding wine and watching Netflix. You've kind of got a plan for this is what we're going to do. And, and the thing is, this can be the funnest, greatest part of your life. You've done all these things now. You've accomplished parenting. You know, you, your kids are alive. They're going to college. They're, life is moving on. Even if they're still at home or not, the path isn't exactly like you expected, you're getting to a period of independence where you can do what you want. 
I mean, that's what cracked open the opportunity for me to open my own firm, Jonathan. And, you know, that was obviously an incredible, amazing journey. And, and so anyway, all of that period of time that you're, that you have as an empty nester that's coming can be by far the most fulfilling of your life. So you, you decided to pour yourself, you know, when the kids left, you decided to pour yourself into building Prairie Fire into what it is today. What hobby did you, did you pick up any hobbies that were, that's actually enjoyable? Cause I know that's a lot of work. I know you put a lot of work into building your firm. Mm-hmm. Any, any, any fun hobbies that you at least picked up? So we did downsize. Um, and as part of downsizing, we moved to the south side of a golf course. And so we have made a huge groups of friends in that community and we golf a lot. So <laughs> that was definitely a part of that. But that group, those groups, we have what we call fun jars. And we every now and then we'll pull something out and it'll be like a trip to Kansas City or we're all going to go bowling or we're all going to do X, Y, or Z. Uh, we, axe throwing we did last time. So again, it's a new journey, a new time, and you can develop new relationships. The funny thing is all these parents were – parents at the same time I was just, and even in the same schools, but for whatever reason, it coalesces when the kids begin to leave and stuff. And so we also have in the, and on my website is an empty nest dream journal. And that can begin to lay out. These are the things that we want to think about doing now that the now that we can. I love that. And we're going to make sure we're like I said, we're going to link to all that in the show description, the show notes. So uh, make sure you check those out because yeah, having a dream journal it sounds Probably corny if you're listening to it if we start talking about a dream journal, but I think that is uh, it is important to start that because I do feel that parents are usually concerned about the cost aspect of you know of college, but it seems like that empty nest syndrome just kind of hits them like a brick out of nowhere. Is that if you're not thinking about it, you're only thinking about the finances. Is that what you found that a lot of people just kind of go into that empty nest part of it unprepared with what that looks like? Yeah. I mean, there's the shock that you're going through in high school a little bit, but some kids go away, man, they don't come back. They enjoy independence and they, they on campus during the summers and they're going to all their friends' weddings. And it just, uh, it, if you don't allow it some room to breathe it can be really, really painful. And so, um, you know, thinking, just thinking about some of these things before isn't going to necessarily make them easier, but you might be able to process them a little more quickly. That, that is great. One last question for you. Obviously we want everybody to go out, pick up this book is if you've been watching us, you've seen it. It's our, it's our, you know, fancy decoration in the back of our, our show here. Um, what is your biggest takeaway that you want someone who reads this book to be able to take away from that, from, from the book? Yeah, I would go back to what I mentioned earlier. You've done great work as a parent. If you're able to send your kid to school or what that looks like. Um, if, if you've parented a kid and they're in high school right now and they're making it, you should be really, really proud of, of the work that you've done. And there is incredible hope on the other side of this journey. It, it doesn't end when the kids leave. A whole new chapter begins. And so hang on to that as you go through the tough days of my kids 20 minutes late for curfew or they're in college and you get their white claw bill or whatever the deal may be. (laughs) Matt, thank you again. Matt Moline, full empty nest, full pockets. Make sure you pick this up. We're going to link to the uh, where you can buy it on Amazon and all the resources that Matt mentioned here in the show. Thank you very much, Matt, for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. Well, Jonathan, thank you. I so appreciate you guys. And this is a great opportunity. And thanks for all the great work you're doing.